And uh, to begin, in first, in first Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, it says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I'm holy. And when you and I, uh, we are reminded of the call to holiness. And really, 1 Corinthians is a renewed call to holy living what it means to be a holy people. A little bit of background. Corinth was found, uh, was not founded by Paul. The church in Corinth was founded by Paul uh, in the late 40s, early 50s. Paul, as you know, went all around the Roman world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And wherever he went, uh, God blessed and uh, people came to Christ. There was also people that tried to kill him wherever he went, but that he didn't let that stop him from sharing the gospel of Jesus. Uh, the, the city of Corinth, though, was, uh, go to the next slide, please, Scott. Uh, oh, no, go back then. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the city of Corinth um, was a large, affluent Roman city uh, known for its, uh, its vices and its sexual sin. Just outside of the city was a large temple to Aphrodite served by 1,000 temple prostitutes. Um, and so that was the, a little bit of the environment that they lived in. There's also a neat little uh, feature. It was a port city, and uh, there's about a four, there's actually a, a channel that's been dug through the rock, so you can go through bo by boat through this channel that was cut through the, between the, that made it, separated the island. But in those days, uh, to get, p sailors would drive up to the one side, and they would portage their boat four miles across the isthmus to get to the other side of the ocean. So it was, uh, it was worth the effort rather than the hundreds and hundreds of miles uh, to go around. And so it was a, it was a bustling city with a lot of uh, people coming and going through it, but also uh, a lot, uh, it had its, its more than its fair share of uh, problems socially. And so Paul founds a church there, and, uh, and as blessed as the church was, they did have some big spiritual problems. And that's why when I was thinking about the text, I discovered, the, actually, next slide now, please, Scott, is I discovered really what I believe to be uh, the, the, the key verse uh, to unlocking sort of why does Paul go in the direction he does in 1 Corinthians. For those of you that have read 1 Corinthians as a whole, you'll notice that Paul, uh, he starts out very warmly in verses 1 through 9, but then he immediately begins uh, this corrective uh, regarding a number of the sins that the church was struggling with. The first uh, one that we'll look at today was they were fighting with each other, but they also had a whole bunch of other issues that, uh, that they were wrestling with, including incest and all sorts of sexual immorality and wild worship. They, whatever you could do that was probably wrong, they were doing. And so Paul writes this letter as their sort of a spiritual father in the faith, uh, saying, hey, listen, um, this is not what Christ called you to. This is not how we live as the followers of Jesus Christ. And so when I look at, think about a key verse, look, in verse, um, look at verse 2. Paul begins in, in chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Now, almost immediately, uh, it's, you're, we, can, we, we might not be able to, we, not, we might not grab onto how significant what Paul just said is. Because it really, he sets the table in his introduction. All the themes that he speaks of in verses 1 to 9, and we'll read verses 1 to 9 in a moment, all those things he, he unpacks later on. But in, right, up, right at the top, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and what? Called to be his holy people. And Paul, in the rest of the book, he basically, in addressing the various sins that they struggle with, he's reminding them, We've been called to be a holy people, and so when so some of these some of these things that you're struggling with are not indicative of the holy life that God has called you to, and so He's reminding us that the call of Christ and giving our lives to Him, coming under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, is a call to holiness. Hence, the words of God: "Be holy, as I am holy." But uh, now, the what were some of the sins that the, the, the church struggled with? I have a slide for you. Uh, 
is, uh, you know, you, you, you usually think uh, Sin City, you think Vegas. <sighs> Corinth was uh, bigger than that. Uh, they, that was, it was the original Sin City. As I mentioned, a thousand temple prostitutes, uh, the goddess of Aphrodite, that people, actually the phrase to Corinthianize meant specifically that you were, go, that you were going to Corinth to find a, a prostitute. Uh, and so the world over, Corinth, whenever anyone said, hey, the city of Corinth, if, they thought, if you were going there, they thought you were going there for a reason. Uh, and, uh, the, and, and people around the world had, even with their morality, had a low estimate of the city of Corinth. Just like if I think of Vegas, I don't have a very high estimate of, of Vegas. First thoughts when it comes to Vegas are, well, you just, the same thoughts you have when you think of Corinth. And so around the world, that's the people had a low estimate of, of the city of Corinth. And, but here, there's this bustling church, a, a large church, but a church where, that composed the people that had been saved from this, in the city of Corinth. So you imagine where, wherever we come from, the sins that we had before we came to Christ, sometimes we continue to struggle with for a while. And so Paul addresses that in this particular letter. They particularly, they were far, arguing with each other. There was factions, there was elitism, there was pride. Chapter five, Paul addresses the fact that there is incest that they actually approved of in the church. Uh, they were suing each other. Uh, there was all manner of sexual sin. There was the problem of uh, disregard of marriage, the abuse of the Lord's Supper. There was wild worship. There was insensitivity in the use of sp the spiritual gifts that God had given them. And then Paul addresses in the last part of Corinthians, there was even people that denied that there would be a future resurrection of the dead. And so that explains why Paul spends so much time in the last couple of chapters talking about the nature of the resurrection body to counter those that were there that were saying, hey, you know what, the, there is no resurrection to come. And so Paul is writing this letter and it all really hinges upon this, this little verse in verse two, sanctified in Christ Jesus, and called to be his holy people. And so what does it mean to be a holy people? What does it mean to be uh, set apart in Christ? And so Paul begins to work with, with those that he calls. He calls himself a spiritual father to them because he's the one that, that uh, founded the church. And, and, and so he, he has this very, uh, this very fatherly tone of, hey, I love you, but... Uh, this is this. Here's how you're, here's how we're supposed to live as the followers of Jesus. Now, one neat thing is, it's actually before we go any further, let's read verses one to nine. Verses one to nine is the warmest part of the text, and it's Paul's introduction. Paul, uh, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Some of you may recognize the name Sosthenes in Acts chapter eighteen. Sosthenes was actually the ruler of the synagogue in the city of Corinth. Uh, people, the, the Jews uh, that were there did not like what Paul was saying. They tried to have Paul, uh, they, they've had Paul dragged before the governor and the governor rejected the charges that they were bringing against Paul. And then um, the, the other Jews of the synagogue actually turned on, on their ruler, uh, on Sosthenes, and they beat him up. And so it's kind of interesting that it, 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 it's, it's uh, speculated uh, that this Thosthenes was once the ruler of the synagogue who's now himself a follower of Christ. And so, uh, and, but that, that's a little backstory that you can find where the, Paul founds the church in Acts chapter 18. To the church of, of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you've been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when I think about that is, though the, uh, the next slide please, Scott. Though the Corinthians struggled with being holy, I want you to, we should note very uh, critically, to note their standing that they had in Christ and note the assurance of salvation that was for them. 
That's important for you and I, isn't it? We know what it is to struggle with being holy. And sometimes we have uh, nipping at the edge of our mind as I, I wonder if I'm a real Christian because I can't seem to, to get, rid of, get this out of my life. And so when Paul, when, when Paul talks to the Corinthians and he lists all these sins that they were committing, and we see, wow, these people were just as messed up as I am, just as messed up as, as anyone is. That's, that's the part of the beauty of, of the text is, is we can we could read First Corinthians and we could say, wow, these people are, these people are crazy. Or we could read and say, you know what, I can, I, I see what, I can, I, under, I can connect with this because I struggle with sin myself. And the call to live a holy life, there's, it, it's a tough one. And, and getting away from the way of the world and getting away from the sins I struggled with are, are difficult. But I'm not going to give up. I'm going to pursue an, after Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm committed to living a holy life. Uh, and, and, and in the midst of all that, how does he address them? These people who were doing all these things, he says, you have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Your standing before God is in Christ. You're viewed as holy in the sight of, of the Father because you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ shed his blood for your sins. Uh, he took the punishment that you deserved. And so you have this standing in Christ. And he says, you need to live up to the standing that you have. You need to pursue holiness. But here's how you're seen. You're seen as sanctified in Christ Jesus. He also says in verse 8, it, that he gives them a word of assurance. He doesn't take away any assurance. He actually affirms that, you know, I've, I've seen evidence that you're followers of Christ. That, for example, he says, um, the spiritual gifts that you have are evidence that the that the Holy Spirit indwells you. Uh, now we also read later on that they had a problem when it came to the exercise of their spiritual gifts. But he says, there's evidence of your faith. He says in verse eight, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the, what, what, what words Paul gives to them, what a, what a gift he gives to them uh, is saying, hey, listen, I, I'm not here to take away your assurance of salvation. I want you to realize that what the, the work, and actually, what does it say in Philippians 1, verse 6? He who began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion. And so you and I, as a takeaway, we recognize that no matter how much sometimes we struggle with being holy, we're, we're reminded of our standing in Christ, sanctified in Christ Jesus. We're also reminded that, that the Lord, the work the Lord began, began in our lives, the Lord will carry on to completion. And so that gives us... Uh, great comfort to our minds at times because at times uh, we're our worst enemies uh, and, and Satan is the accuser who says, well, you're not really a Christian because why can't you get a, get a hold of this in your life? And Paul says that right off the top, he says, this is your position in Jesus Christ and this is the assurance that you have in Jesus Christ. And, but then, and then he goes on to say, now here's how to live the holy life that God has called you to. And so as I already mentioned, the big issue in, in Corinth, and we're going to read uh, verses uh, 10 through 17 now, is uh, they, they struggle with sin. Uh, and, and Paul, right off the top, starts out, out by addressing the fact that, um, you know what, he says, I hear that uh, you're not getting along with each other. And chapters 1 to 4, in chapters 1 to 4, Paul takes a number of turns here and there to unpack this. And we can get lost sometimes. We can miss the forest for the trees. Uh, but when we, if we step back and we say, what is chapters 1 to 4 about as a whole? It's the call to Christian unity. And he's addressing the problem of division in the church. And so let's have a look at verses uh, 10 through 17. So after saying all of these uh, nice things in verses 1 through 9 and being very warm... He then turns and says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions amongst you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels amongst you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas, which is uh, Peter. Uh, and still another who's really holy says, I follow Christ. Uh, now then Paul says, is Christ divided? 
Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. And then sort of funnily he says, and then, oh wait, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone. For Christ, then he gets back on target, uh, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And that serves, the wisdom and elo eloquence comment then serves to set up um, Paul's discussion that leads through the, ba the balance of chapter one and chapter two, uh, the Corinthians, uh, they had somehow bought into the, uh, the, the idea that, uh, you know, just preaching the message of the cross and that Jesus died uh, for our sins and took the punishment that we deserve, that had to be dressed up somehow. Uh, and, and, and that a person coming to the Lord relied upon fancy words and logic and all sorts of things. And Paul says, you know what, there's, there's a basic message that we just have to stick to, and that's the message of the gospel, the, the, re the rescue mission that Jesus came on. And I'll get in, into that a bit more uh, in a few minutes. But we know the big issue in Corinth, the big issue was this was a church that was in conflict. It was a church that was divided. Uh, one of the, the interesting features about the church then was they, the church didn't meet in buildings like you and I had uh, have together here. They, they originally started out in the synagogue, uh, but then when then the, the Jews uh, that, that uh, weren't following Christ said, you can't meet here anymore, and they got kicked out, and then people began to meet in house groups. So when he talks about some from Chloe's house, that, that was a particular house group in the city, and there was house groups that were all, all over, uh, and, and that's how they were organized in, in, in those days. And so Paul is sort of their, uh, their, their uh, over, since he founded the church there, he has, he has responsibility for the, the house groups that are in the city of Corinth. And, and his appeal to them is, is you, you, need to, uh, you need to learn how to get along and you need to love one another. And I, when I hear that there's fighting and I hear there's factions, he says, you know, this is, this is very troubling. In fact, so troubling, what does Paul say in uh, a little bit later? He says in chapter three, if you have a look at chapter three, where Paul picks up the theme of division in the church again, he says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Those are pretty hard words right there. Because uh, he's just finished talking about the Spirit of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. But he says, uh, right now it's hard for me to talk about you like that because you keep fighting with each other. Uh, he says, uh, you, uh, he says, but are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. He says, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. For there, since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you just not mere human beings? So he says, this is a problem, and it's indicative of, and, and so it's hard to speak about being holy if you're fighting with each other. Which, I guess, I think I have a slide for that. Is, uh, there's a point. It's hard to be holy if we're at odds with our brothers and sisters in Christ. When the church is in conflict, when brothers and sisters in the Lord are uh, arguing with each other, it, it's, it's nigh impossible to say, well, I'm living a holy life. Uh, because when the body of Christ is divided, uh, you know, what, is this, what is the saying? A house divided will what? Fall. Uh, you know, it, when I think about the subject of uh, unity and division and, and the church getting along, it's, it's very relevant. Uh, relevant in our day and even in our church history. Some of you know our church history a little bit. Twice in over the 80 years that this church has been here, the church has split. Two times. And by God's grace, the church is still here. Uh, but that's part, of our, that's part of our church history is once in the 50s, and another in the 60s, I believe. Uh, the church, uh, they, they're, they're, there was a few, and, and, a lot of, and one of them was over something actually really silly <laughs> that they could have figured it out if they had tried, which, which shows you where a lot of our problems come from miscommunication, don't they? Jumping to conclusions, 
uh, you know, we uh, sometimes um, unmet expectations or, or lack of social skills in some cases. What, what causes conflict amongst people? Uh, and, and when I think about the subject of unity, one of my prayers all the time is that we would stay on the same page in Christ, that we would love one another, that there'd be graciousness and forgiveness. Uh, and, and, you know, if I, if I hear of, uh, you know, if there's, when you hear about people talking about people, these are upsetting things because it, they won't help the body of Christ. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, I, and so when Paul talks about the, he says, I hear there's divisions in the church and, he's, and I, he's appealing to them to get along with each other. That message has been relevant for, for 2,000 years in the church's history. Uh, we, one of the things that we realize is, why is the world so full of so many different kinds of churches? <laughs> the answer is we don't get along very well with each other sometimes. Uh, and, and so some people get upset, they go down the street, they start a new church. Then someone in there gets upset and they go down the street and they start a new church. Uh, and so we see, born out of, we see born out of conflict a whole bunch of different brands of churches. Uh, and, and when we think about what, is, what does God want for us to do, he wants us to keep our eyes fixed on Christ. He, wants to, he also, Paul in the unpacking, uh, he, after his appeal for unity and his calling out the division in the church, he, he, he speaks to them, he reminds them of what they were when, before they came to Christ. He says, you really have no basis for pride and division. Just remember where you came from. Uh, and, and then he, um, he, he ta- and he says, and when, when, when Peter and me and Apollos and Cephas hear about our names being brought up, like you're following us, he goes, that's pretty distressing as well. Uh, uh, and so the call is, is we are to, we are to do everything we can. I, that's a... That's another slide, please, Scott. We're to do everything we can uh, to, live, to live as a holy people. Uh, we need to do all we can to maintain and build up unity in the body of Christ. You know, Paul, uh, and, and along the way, we're reminded that anything that happens, this is why Paul, Paul refused to take any glory for himself, because have a look, really neat, uh, really neat verses, chapter 3. So here he says, and he says, I'm really, we're really upset that you keep using our name to justify your factions and your divisions in, chapter, in verses 1 to 5, 4 of chapter 3. He says, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? What are we? We're only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but who's the one that makes every, anything grow? It's God. And so Paul says, the credit is, doesn't belong to us. Uh, and, and whenever there's spiritual growth, whenever a person comes to Christ uh, and, 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 and God prospers and blesses a place, it's not because of the individuals there. It's because of the Holy Spirit working. Paul talks about the role of the Holy Spirit in, in, in the church in the, in the previous chapters. And his point is, is that... Uh, you know, when a person comes to Christ, it's the Holy Spirit who does the work of convicting and who draws a person to Jesus. And he says, that's not, our, that's not my work. My job is to be faithful, he says, in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I think about the subject, and we think about the subject of, you know, doing what we can to maintain unity in the body of Christ, Paul really lays out for us, he says, when he speaks, he speaks extensively about, we, we preach Christ crucified. And that's, my, that's the mission that God gave me. But what's kind of neat is when, when the church gets on that page of saying, hey, you know what, what is it that Jesus wants us to do? He wants us to tell others about him. He wants us to disciple. He wants us to help the poor. Uh, he, these are the things that Christ has called us to. He wants us to gather for corporate worship and prayer and come alongside of each other when, when things are difficult and when things are good and encourage each other to keep following the Lord. When we uh, as a church are doing this, there's unity. Uh, and, the, and so the call to the basics of the Christian faith, which, which actually, when we, you know, I, I always think it's such a wonderful thing. I, one of the things is, is, you know, for example, when we uh, put on uh, the breakfast down at 41, and we have, our, we have uh, those that are able to come. Uh, some of you can't come because of your schedule, and that's fine. Please pray for us when we go. But when we unite in prayer, or whether we're on site, 
that coming together has just as much effect just in, in us coming together as a team as actually doing handing out the place of food or mingling because we're united in doing something that we know Christ has called us to do. And that, that binds us together as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so serving together, um, it, 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 is a, uh, it, it counteracts uh, division that may arise anywhere. And so we, when, whenever we, as we keep focused on what Christ has given us to do, then, then, the, then the problem of division will not be there. Uh, the, the other thing is when we think about this is uh, what can you and I do if, if we are to do all we can to maintain and build, what, what kind of attitude are we to have? Um, we are to be ones who forgive, who don't hold grudges, uh, who, who, who uh, you know, today it used to be, for example, um, when, uh, when it comes to, we, we live in another world now, don't we, than, than for when I was a kid. Sometimes when I was a kid, you'd, you'd see uh, someone, someone was upset in the, in the youth group, for example, with someone else, so they, they'd talk to two or three people in the corner. <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, that's not right. <laughs> right? Like, we shouldn't do that. Now people do it online instead. <laughs> and there's, uh, there's groups for it. Uh, but, but those things don't promote unity, do they? And so we, we think about, you know, when, when, I, when I'm put out with somebody, I need to uh, pray about it. I need to talk to them directly, uh, and, I, and I, I need to be a peacemaker. What did Jesus say? He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, and so when we go out of our way to say, hey, you know what, you know, I, I have a, my job is to help smooth the water and to calm things down. Uh, and in fact, all of us have that role, don't we? All of us are called to pe being peacemakers. So if we, and now the, re the reality of this, in, in, uh, in life with each other, whether it's our family, uh, our co-workers, uh, people, you know, wherever we go, getting along with people is always a challenge. Uh, and, and the church is like a big learning lab for how to live as a Christian as well. Uh, and so we, so we say, okay, you know, Lord, give me patience, give me wisdom, help me uh, to forgive, fill my heart with love for each other, for other people. And particularly, you know, I... Uh, Probably like you, if I said, who, who do you have problems with sometimes getting along with? It's easy to, that, that person pops into our head easily, doesn't it? Um, and, but one of the things I'm convicted about is, is, as soon as I start thinking about it, you know, as soon as I start thinking about someone that irritates me, I get wound up, don't I? And then all of a sudden I'm like, but that isn't right. Um, and then I think, but what does the Lord want? The Lord wants me to love them. And so then I'm, then I'm left saying, Lord, put a little bit of love in my heart uh, because we actually have to pray that because it's, it's when, because to counteract all those, those, those negative thoughts. And so blessed are the peacemakers and, and, you know, and God bless you when you pray that prayer, Lord, put some love in my heart, take away that edge, help me to forgive that, whatever it is in the resentment I might have uh, because I want, I want to be the peacemaker. I want to be, uh, glue that, that helps hold the church together. And so we, when we do that, and, and also then when we're proactively saying, hey, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to promote peace and unity in, in, the, in the church, I'm going to actively get, try to get involved in other people's lives. Not to meddle, but just to be friendly and outgoing and caring. These, these things promote unity. And then when there's a project to do, say, hey, you know what, let's get on board together because you know what, what does Jesus want us to be doing? He wants us to be telling others about Christ. He wants us to be giving to the poor. He wants us to be coming alongside of those that are grieving uh, and, and to encourage them. Um, the caring, caring ministry is an, is, an, is an example. These things working together as the body of Christ. Now you may think, oh, does, uh, does Todd have some particular thing in mind that is really bothering about church unity? No. <laughs> I, I praise God for the unity that God has blessed us with. But I always know that, I know from our church history that it's been an issue. I know from reading the Bible that, that it's so vital that you and I, uh, every once in a while, hear a good message about how important it is to forgive, to, to love each other, to commit to walking and getting on the same page. Because that, the, a house divided will fall, 
And as a church, we need to stick together in Christ with the Bible and Christ at, at, at the forefront and, and truly saying, Lord, help me to, to love my brothers and sisters in the Lord so that we can have, we can enjoy this, this the fruit of unity and being together. And then one great verse as we close and we're gonna sing um, is uh, Psalm 133. It's, uh, it says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And it truly is a wonder, wonderful thing when we are on the same page together and it's Christ is our focus and, and serving him and, and coming alongside of one another. God bless you. Let's stand together as we sing. Uh, Matthew, if you could turn up the monitor volume for this last song. And...